Thank you, folks. As the credits roll, please welcome the co-writers and directors of the film. You know them well, Christian Abate and Steve Tenenbaum. <laughs> And as mentioned, we're so honored to have here to moderate the conversation, the executive director of New York Women in Film and Television, Cynthia Lopez. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Yeah. How are you? Good. How are we doing, New York? I have, t I have to say, I have tears in my eyes, and I watched this is the second time. It is such an amazing film. I think it is such a New York film. It is New York because it is sentimental and painful and truthful and authentic. So congratulations. It's an Thank incredible you. film. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure. If it's so I'm going to start off with a couple of questions, and then we'll go to Q&A. So describe a little bit of how you created this creative partnership. Tell us a little bit about it. Should I go or you go? You, you want to start? No, you can go. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> so Stephen and I met 20-something uh, years ago um, in a community dance and acting program in the West Village. And Stephen was a teacher who would come in on Fridays and, and teach us kids writing and performing our own shows. And I was just so drawn to Stephen um, because he's very funny. <laughs> and he just showed me a world that I, I didn't know that I needed. Um, and we really bonded over that. Um, and, and him helping me shape how stories are told and the importance of learning how to tell your own story. And so over the years, we just stayed connected. And when my life really fell apart, <laughs> uh, I reached out to Stephen because I remembered the, the partnership we had at such a young age and having somebody who really cared and somebody who was willing to, to show me how to grow. And I reached out to him and I said, hi, are you still there? Do you remember me? And can I, can I do whatever you're doing? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I have, I'm, I'm doing some theater uh, downtown, like come by. And it was actually a show where you would put your name in the hat and then they would pull it out. And it was called Project 30 and it ran for a number of years and it was incredible. Mm. And we reconnected through that, and then I just never let go because, I mean, you don't really meet people like Steven ever, so. <laughs> oh. Now your turn. Now you say something nice about me. Oh, go. okay. <laughs> Fast. I was just, I was, I was almost getting cuddly listening to you talk about me. I know. I don't, kn I don't ever say these nice things at <laughs> home, ever. <laughs> um... Also, there, there was another actress as well from... The girl who played the best friend who, yes. who moves to Canada, she was also part of that class as well. Yes. So, so yeah. that's one of the things we like to do when we have projects is we like to m mix up, you know, people from the past, people from the street, and, and, uh, and actors. And there, yeah, there's people in the room here, um, Di McCall, who we've worked with um, through other projects. Yes, and many times. And, and many times, and who have been part of that sort of authentic <laughs> theater experience. They, yes. they, I'm sure they have memories they could share about it. This, uh, <laughs> and I've been working with her now since she was nine years old. And... Um, you know that's that's not typical, and it's just been you know a pleasure for me. Now tell us a little bit. I know when we were speaking about the film um, earlier this week, and I said, "What were the greatest challenges you faced in making the film?" Steve, you want to start off and let folks know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this film took about six years to make. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> and 
we had filmed about two thirds of it, and um, and then I decided to have a stroke. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, yeah, it's, it it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm better now. Yeah. Um, and so I was um, laid up for I don't know. Like, like a year. He he lost the ability to speak, walk, um, had to relearn how to eat, read everything right in the middle of us making this film and the film was a lifeline for Stephen to recover as quickly as he did to regain his speech to regain the capacity to walk all we did was talk about the movie when he was in the hospital and you know hey we have to finish this film and Armando and Lindsay who worked with us for a number of years um, they worked in documentary and so they understood that we were going to need more time <laughs> and, and money and money, and they were very patient through that challenge. And then Stephen, because you know he's a showman, uh, decided that wasn't enough. And can I tell them, or do you want to tell them? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, he broke his neck a year later after recovering from his stroke. Um, yes. Yeah. So that was another year. But of the good recovery. thing about that is you couldn't even tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's actually straighter now. If you can't. Yeah. Yeah. And then what was the third challenge that you faced? There was three challenges? Oh, uh, I had like a... Like a mini heart attack or yeah, something. Yeah. 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 So when I was... I was bored. When I was speaking to them, I really, you know, I always talk to filmmakers and I say, what is your greatest challenge? And most filmmakers will say money and the Oh, no, that's a great challenge. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but wait, she's going to say something. <laughs> and, and the amount of years. I know you guys uh, sort of surprised that it took six years uh, an average documentary that's up for an Emmy or any kind of industry award is anywhere from 10 to 12 years. By the time, from beginning when you had the idea to the end where it's on broadcast or distribu distributed at a theatrical release like this one. Um, so when I was speaking to Steve, it was a heart attack, it was a stroke, and then he broke his neck and the film still got made. And that, to me, shows the testament of the creative folks in front of you. Um, because, you know, I just have a sprained ankle and I've been limping around and my daughter's like, oh my God, you're acting so hysterical. And I'm like, no, no, it's been a couple of weeks and it doesn't get fixed. And I'm like, I can't imagine what it's like to go through three major, major um, difficulties, but still saying, this film needs to be completed and we're gonna do it anyway. So I think this deserves another round of applause because it is incredible what they've been through to we make We just wanted film. things to talk about at the Q&A. <laughs> we didn't want to bore you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's also just a testament to the power of creative relationships and partnerships that finishing the film became you know, what saved us and what got us through such a horrible thing. And, and the fact that we were so close already, you know, that we weren't willing to sacrifice not only our relationship, but the art that we're creating, which is sort of a, an honor to our relationship and to the importance of interdependence and creating a family and using art as, you know, not an esoteric way, but an actual way to survive um, and move past any hurdle, whether it's physical or mental, you know, this film, is obviously there's physical disability, but it's also about the mental aspect of it too, and the mind, and what depression does, and anxiety does, and you know what what happens to people when they don't have that support system. And so, Stephen and I have sort of been this like yin yang situation where you know, the times where I've really struggled with my mental health and have not been capable of taking myself out of those holes, Stephen has pulled me out and brought me, you know, whatever, into the light, literally, and also with this film, you know, these were big lessons for us um, and how people view our creative relationship, you know, it's not just being like, just about, oh, making a movie together. This is, we're here now, and Steven is here with all of us because, you know, we were willing to go that far for each other and for, for a film, which is crazy. <laughs> Well, I have to say today, uh, you know, I was working in the afternoon and someone said to me, uh, what are you doing tonight? And I said, I'm going to see a love story. Mm -hmm. And it is at Real Abilities. He, and I said, Isaac, he, 
he definitely distributes lots of love stories because that's what I think this is about. Mm -hmm. It's about love and caring. And also when you're all sitting in the backyard and you're kind of desperate, this is what I felt, uh, disparate New Yorkers, if you will, but you're so connected. Um, tell us a little bit about your creative choices and your aesthetic choices. Um, sometimes it has to do with money. <laughs> um, we filmed that er, almost every yeah, interior scene was filmed where I live. Wow. It's just in different rooms. Many, many, many different and, uh, <laughs> floors. I know my sister is here somewhere, so I have to thank her. Where is she? Raise your hand. <gasps> She's hiding, oh, unbelievably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and, well, first of all, you know, we've been doing this. I, I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time. And I've been, you know, perfecting or honing how I want to do things and who I want to do them with, you know, and how I do them. And this 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 project was a culmination of the things that I, over the years, of doing like 15 years of theater and then moving to film and, and you know, all the experiences with the, the school for the young dancers and teaching in Rikers Island and it's it just a culmination of all those things. And, you know, I, I don't even know exactly what I'm doing anymore. I don't know if I'm making a movie or a thing or what. I just, it's just what I do. I you know, I don't think about it any other way. I just, you know, oh, I gotta, ha I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think that's also why the film looks the way it does and it feels the way it does because there's a lot of stuff that takes place on the streets of the city and um, Armando, who's the editor and cinematographer, that's producer, he was literally across the street or down the block, you know, on another avenue with these Cook lenses that are, you know, as tall as a person so that we can interact with New Yorkers and we can just put the characters on the street and just let the world play around us. But sometimes you know, we knew the people. Sometimes we knew the people, but you we can yeah, guess which yeah. ones <laughs> Some people home. in here know who those yeah, people yeah. are. <laughs> well, one of your creative choices that really um, stood with me was when you're yelling at the little girl when she's in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And um, again, when we have bad days in New York, mm -hmm. we yeah. sometimes take it out on the wrong people, right? And sometimes we just we give it back to the people who gave it to us. Right. So <laughs> I right. like that. But how, how did you decide to do that scene? Or what propelled you to do that scene? Well, just yeah. it was at the point of the script where, you know, all the pent up feelings just came out. Mm -hmm. She just, you know, provoked something and <laughs> unfortunately got the brunt of it. And uh, that little girl who's not little anymore, she was, I think, what, 10? 10 when she filled it, and now she's like 16 or something. Oh. Yeah. And she's also like six feet tall now. <laughs> she's like a supermodel. Yes. Insane. Yeah, she I mean, was you could tell uh, she's gonna in, uh, what was she in? in uh, the I don't know, but she was like auditioning for TV shows between our takes. Oh, <laughs> you know? my yeah, goodness. She's like, okay. It's amazing. What was, the, what yeah, was she's the Broadway like show she was in? Lion King. The Lion King. And oh Tina my Turner. Goodness. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So, um... But yeah, her character, you know, in that yes. moment too, I think that's like a good thing to point out is that, you know, like she is a child in that and there's that sort of inner child, adult, you know, just like how much this character is really struggling with her feelings about herself and how she, you know, moves and breathes in this world. And like in that moment, that kid is all of the things she's really saying to herself, you know, and she's just this representation of that. And her mother was right there, so. She was not yeah, I was hard. Like, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Her daughter's great. She's yeah. amazing. Now, what do you want Fuck audiences you. to take away after watching the film? What's the one message you want people to take away? Well, I mean, New York is really, you know, many communities. Mm -hmm. And it's like everybody's responsible for making their community and, you know, and, and getting their nourishment from it. Mm -hmm. And... I I hope 
this movie, you can see the value of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that, you know, the relationships that are worth saving take work, and it's hard to to have them and to be flawed in front of another person. And that, you know, I really love what you said about it being a love story, you know, and, and that really didn't occur to us until we saw it all together and we realized, you know, this is a love story between me and Steven and to our relationship and to others who have these relationships um, and also to New York, you know, and also to the place that brought us together. And it's really cool to have this screening with New Yorkers because you guys, you just like, you're getting all the New Yorkness and that's just so sweet because we've been all over the world with this film and audiences everywhere just pick up on different things, you know, and so it, it's cool to speak with the New York audience, people who get it and see the inside this and out of it. our first New York audience. Yeah, New York Absolutely. City audience, yeah. So Absolutely. thank you guys for being here, yeah. Let's go to Q and A. The New York audience you. can't be quiet, right? We I have someone up. Um, as a lifelong New Yorker, first thing I want to say is thank you. I've never seen New York look so beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it was something I recognized, but I don't know. Where lighting. is this? I was like, <laughs> I know this place, but it's even prettier on TV. Um, no, but um, and as a lifelong New Yorker, I think one of the beautiful things about it, what I always say is what I love about New Yorkers is that whether they're flipping you the bird or they're smiling at you, you know it's real. And I think you captured so many, uh, you know, it, what, I'm glad that it wasn't just shitty moments, to be honest, that there were moments of kindness, the people who found the dog, you know, all that. And obviously we have the physical manifestation of someone who's having trouble facing herself and meets another her and at first doesn't want to. I, I think there's so much about identity and how we connect with people and usually it's not that direct, you know? Um, but I, I, you know, and I have to say that I, when, as a film selection committee member, usually when I see someone with a disability paying for sex in one of the films that I'm, sorry, there's been quite a few uh, things that we've screened privately that are about that. I usually don't want the film because I don't like the notion that we need to pay for sex in order for right. you know p people with disabilities to be sexual. Mm. But it was very clear to me. First of all, you created nuanced characters. I mean, the main character has such a personality. And yes, she's cynical and she's sassy and she's funny and like all these things. Um, so you won me over is what I'm trying to say. And it was so New York. And I have to, all, I don't know how well you guys know Johnny Ryan Sosa, but oh I went God. to school oh with yeah. him. Oh I went way. to school with him at Wesley. And so um, uh. I promise there's a question here. I think <laughs> my, my, my Where is Johnny Ryan Sosa? Yes. Yes, and uh, we could talk for hours about Johnny Ryan. He's his own universe. But, um, but I think my question is about community. What, what do you think that we can, because I think what's beautiful about this film is it makes me want to say hi to my neighbors even more than I already do. So I guess my question is, was that intentional? Like, obviously, you've created a community for yourselves, but was there something you wanted us to get from the film about community or support? Because that's, um, I guess, what mm -hmm. I'm well, thinking sure. about. Yeah. Sure. We, it's just, you know, you have to make a community of who you're with, not who you want to be with. And that's, I know it's like a pretty simplistic lesson, but yeah, but don't discount who, who you have already. Yeah. That's, you know, you just, that's who you have. Mm -hmm. I, th I think this yeah. is, Stephen, so <laughs> true. I have to say how I was, uh, I was born and raised in Brooklyn in an area called Sunset Park. My parents lived in a brown, we lived in a brownstone. And on the first floor, this is what reminded me of your film. On the first floor, there was a woman, and we used to call her Booby, and she was <laughs> a Holocaust for survivor. But when I was a kid, I didn't know that. I just saw... You know, to me, it was a tattoo, right? And then on the third floor, we lived on the second floor, and we, my dad's Puerto Rican, and on the third floor, there was an Italian man from Sicily. Mm -hmm. And right. so after school, my brother, every other, my brother and I, every other day, had to go to Booby and had to go to Papa <laughs> to make sure that they had what they needed. It's like what my parents, they're like, they're older, 
and and I would always say, Bubby wants Marlboro cigarettes, <laughs> and I'm not allowed to buy Marlboro cigarettes. And <laughs> my father would say, listen, I can't explain the Holocaust. She's allowed to have whatever she wants, okay? So get her the Marlboro cigarettes. We'll tell the guy in the candy store that it's okay for you to pick them up. And then uh, Pop, Pops always wanted his Italian bread, and he would cut it in slices and freeze some because he lived alone. And he was very grouchy. He was kind of a difficult Italian guy, and he was a bricklayer. When I saw your film, when you say you made like your community, who's there? I kept on thinking, oh my God, this is how I grew up. If you met Bubby, you wouldn't necessarily like her, but we loved her, and we understood that she was kind of grouchy. She would only open the door a little bit. You Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> you put the cigarettes through, and she'd slam the door. Never say thank you, never say, you know. But my dad would always be like, Bubby, you have what you need? And she'd say yes, and everything was good. We have so much in common, because I also used to buy marble cigarettes as a kid <laughs> for a neighbor. It was on the tab at the at the bodega. At yeah. the bodega. Yeah. Well, we had this little. Uh, yeah. It was like a mafia joint where you'd go in and the guy wouldn't sell you cigarettes. But nice. yeah, yeah. when I saw this film, all I kept on thinking is there are pockets of communities throughout New York City that are like this. Right. But it takes special people to embrace mm. the good and the bad, yeah. you know. Or you could shut yourself off. Yeah, and that's kind of what the film, right, it has that aspect. And I'm glad you brought up the sex part because there is a world-renowned sex therapist in the audience, I won't say who. And, um, you know, that for us, it's not about, oh, she's disabled, so she has to pay for sex because nobody cares about her. It's No, she doesn't care about herself, mm -hmm. and she's unwilling to find the community or find somebody who will see her for who she is and who, you know what I mean? Like, it really... It's not about that at all, and I'm glad that you brought that up because I do think it's important to, to make that distinction, mm. you know? So, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. oh, questions? Mm -hmm. And if you could state your name so we know who you are. Sure, my name is Larry Coloresis, mm -hmm. and um, I feel like I'm about to be churlish because this was a film powerful enough to make me cry, mm -hmm. and at the same time, there were certain moments where it was hard for me to suspend my disbelief. And I'm wondering if you would tell me about those choices. One, as someone like most people go through life who's had my heart broken once or twice, um, I was astonished and didn't know if I could quite believe how um, the protagonist came back to the person she was hoping to be her lover to make things right so soon after and, and was able to resolve that. That happened with such breathtaking speed and completion that it was like no other broken-hearted experience that I ever saw in my real life. And I'd like to know more about like how you made that sure. yeah. choice. Well, part of it was we had to finish the film. Yeah, we were like, Jesus Christ, this <laughs> movie's going to be so long if we don't hurry up. Um, but the other thing was she, she was his dog walker. So ostensibly that day she was only back to walk the dog. And there was more of that scene that you don't see. And, and also the dog wasn't cooperating, so we had to take it out of the room. Yeah. Um, so basically, she wasn't there because she got over it. She was just there to walk the dog. And, and then it went down. There's and yeah. hopefully it goes by quickly and you don't think about it. <laughs> but I would also say that, you know, I think picking up on that and sort of the theme that the film started to move towards, which is, you know, the birds and, like, realizing that, you know, flying is not just about wings, right? And, like, you, you actually have to have a place to launch from. And I think there is a part of her at that point that even though she'll fight with Steven later and whatever, or that happened to her, I don't remember. But anyway, she has that purge, you know? And, th and, there, and I can say from experience, having lived with Steven and having the perch and getting my heart broken and smashed around a thousand times and coming home and having such a solid person all the time to just make it right, heartbreak got a lot faster to deal with, you know? And I mean, we're, it's movie time, right? So maybe we're just like a week went by, just. Mm. But I think that's the point of having the perch and that's, you know, the thing is that you get to actually have somebody who well, represents. It's just also at the, you know, when you get to the end of the movie, you have to funnel everything. So, you know, we really didn't want more scenes. Mm. And I think that was the editor 
you know, just <laughs> making it Movie the, magic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so blame him. Yeah, I'll <laughs> give you his number after. Yes. Well, I also was thinking when I mentioned before that I was coming to see a love story, I do think that, um, and New Yorkers specifically, compared to other places in the world, you have to be brave to, to, to go for love. You can't be shy, right? And that takes courage. And there's so many people here who are, and not, not here in this room, but in general, it's easier to be alone and not deal with heartbreak. And again, that was an aesthetic choice to me, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Be brave that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we wanted this character to find that, you know, and not because of a boy or a guy or a relationship, you know, but because this is a much deeper relationship that actually is healing things that matter and that might allow her then to have a, you know, relationship that where she can be whole and seen and, and explore more parts of herself, you know, and it's kind of nice to not, ha I mean, yeah, it's solved by this relationship, but it's not solved by the man and the thing and like, you know, yeah. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's just one movie and it could be, it could go in any, no it could have gone in any number of directions too. And this is the direction we chose, but I mean, there's always 500 other movies you can make from the same topic. Right, and it challenges what you feel and think in your own in your own way, and I think that's why this film is not, you know, it's not, the disability is just a part of who this character is in her world, and it's a story that speaks to everybody, you know, I, I think, I, and I hope that that is what makes this film go beyond that, and it opens up others' eyes to like, oh, yeah, I should talk to my neighbor, I should know more about this person that I see every single day, I should say hello, I should do these things, and I should create a family for myself, you know, and so I think the love story, the universality of what we're trying to do here. Um, is important that we all walk away with that feeling. Mm -hmm. and ultimately, we ultimately, that's not about disability either. That's just about people. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we love here at Real Abilities. We love films that are about the human experience and uh, not necessarily even about the disability. Mm -hmm. um, happens to just include it as well. Um, I want to thank you for this amazing gem of a film. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for this conversation. Cynthia, thank you for leading this conversation and making it so much richer. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, tomorrow we start off with more amazing short films. Don't miss our short films. Then we have Jasmine is a Star, then Upside Down, and our comedy night. Much more all week through Wednesday. Virtual as well. There's no excuses. Tell your friends and join us. Thank you so much, and have a good night. Woo!